So thank you for coming. Um, it's been quite enjoyable the last couple of months being here. This is my first time living in the U.S. since uh, 1995. So it's been a lot of uh, kind of a new experience. This film was shot and tired. No, don't worry, it's all in English. It was shot in the U.S., but I brought my film crew over with me from Germany to shoot it. This was made together with German public television, like the German equivalent of PBS, and it was released theatrically throughout Germany and played at a lot of film festivals around the world and at a few here in the U.S., but it has never been on TV in the U.S., at least not yet. So um, I would like to say enjoy the film, though it's kind of hard to enjoy it. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'll, we'll have this discussion afterwards. There's usually a lot, a lot of questions. So uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs>
you're going to see how we identify these individuals on the panel and how we're going to take what was discussed in the film and bring it to life and bring it to um, understanding what happened with Rick's family and with Rick himself and looking at from a healthcare perspective and a healthcare, uh, we're going to be finding out the individuals that are on the panel giving us a little bit of, more of an insight on the disease or the condition that Rick's father had. Um, uh, if we can just start from here, Rick, if we can go down the line and uh, again introducing and um, it kind of the reason that you're on the panel, and Rick, that's uh, pretty evident why you're on the panel, but uh, if you would start, Rick. Um, I don't think I need to say a whole lot because I was introduced at the beginning, but um, I was born and raised in California, as you more or less, we moved around a lot between California and Arizona and Kansas when I was little, but I was more or less in California, and I went to college in New York City, and then I moved to Europe. So I was actually starting a new life in Europe at the same time that my father was starting his new life as new Richard. We just didn't know about it because I was in the Soviet Union and it was very difficult to communicate with the United States at that time. So it took about two months for me to get the news about what had happened to him. And then it took me 10 years to decide to make a film about it and then it took another six years to make the film. Good evening. I'm Dr. Janine Luther Spack from the School of Nursing and Health Sciences. Um, clinically, I am a board certified adult mental health nurse practitioner, psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. And Dr. Hampy um, had talked to me about participating on this panel, which I'm very honored to be on this and I'm grateful for the opportunity and to shed some light on my experiences in, in working with patients that have this type of amnesia or a dissociative type um, presentation and that that's basically why I'm here tonight to shed some light on just the prevalence how often we see this and just some of the different forms that it can take on because the amnesia really is a large topic we could have a whole uh, night lecture just on that alone but I'll kind of give a synopsis tonight of the different types and then to give you maybe a clearer picture and understanding of possibly what what Rick's dad has experienced. My name's Lou Ann Richardson, Dr. Lou Ann Richardson. I'm also from the School of Nursing and Health Sciences, and I too practice as a nurse practitioner, both in family settings and psychiatric settings. And I am going to answer the question that Holly asked me to answer at a later time. My name is Christina Craigett. I am from the Washington Hospital of the Washington Health Systems. I'm one of the social workers there. And I was brought on board to be part of this panel to discuss some of the reactions, the interventions, and some of the supportive mechanisms um, that can be a part of this family situation. Thank you all very, very much for participating. We're going to start with you as far as doing this film I mean, how much pain you had to go with, uh, undergo in doing this. What was your reason for doing the film? Because, um, you know, you do films, but not necessarily films about your life. And uh, I'm sure seeing again tonight brought about many more memories that you had from living that experience. So if you can just touch on the reason why you felt necessary to do the film. Sure. Um, when you're a filmmaker and something like this happens in your family, it's kind of hard to not make a film about it, I think. It was staring me in the face all these years. It just took me a long time to start because I was just, I just graduated from college. I was an English major. I hadn't made any films yet, aside from a few little Super 8 experiments. So I was still trying to develop as a filmmaker and I was busy starting my own new life in Europe and those first few years I wasn't too concerned about what was going on with my father quite frankly. I was just a young man uh, finding, his way in the <clears throat> finding his way in the world. But I did, um, fortunately I uh, was in Europe but I came back to the US to start film school in California. I was there for one year. And during that time, I filmed him, some of the stuff that's in the early part of the film, like when we're sitting on the fence together. 
I just filmed that during that one year of film school and when we were editing the film we were very happy to discover that footage that it still existed because it became a real treasure in trying to uh, show how he moved and how he talked in those early years. So when I made the conscious decision to make the film that was in two, I was 32 years old and I thought oh I'm an adult I have a family of my own this can't be so bad um, I was I thought I'd find some kind of black and white answer to the whole story that I, I still thought that either you uh, you lose everything or, or not <laughs> with amnesia that it just seemed like an all or nothing thing um, I was very wrong I was very wrong about just about everything that I assumed when I went into this and it was the most horrible experience of my life uh, <clears throat> but I survived it and um, l looking back on it I'm glad I did it but it was pretty horrible Janine, you talked about your experience in having patients that have experienced amnesia. After seeing the film and seeing what um, Richard's father went through, what would you, how can you help us understand what amnesia is in the clinical aspects of it? Yes. Thank you, I'd be glad to respond to that. First, I would like to say I respect you so much for your courage and your family's courage because this had to be very, very difficult. And I just know that I didn't have the emotional investment in it, and I watched this multiple times before this evening. And I can honestly say that each time I, there was more impact on me in watching the nonverbals of your sisters and, and just the inflection in the voice tone in each time that it made me kind of go into that journey with the empathy of how painful this had to be. And I think your sister touched on it the most significant as far as making an impression on me where she lost her best friend and it would have been easier if there would have been possibly a passing or a death because this was much harder. So I truly respect- that was his sister. His, yeah, <laughs> his, your yeah. aunt, yes, yeah. yes, that's, that's correct, I apologize. But just like what it did as far as, you know, just, just almost a grief, mm -hmm. you know, grieving. So as far as um, with the different types of amnesia, if we talk about the general type of amnesia, which most people relate to having a head injury or some neurobiological cause. Obviously, there was nothing founded. There was nothing that, that showed, you know, despite major tests. And so which makes us think of something much deeper. And if we look at a general type of amnesia, there's different types of um, amnesia that if it's a, an infarct of the brain or some some assault on the brain and there's two types and one basically is called retrograde where the person loses the ability to recall any type of previously stored memories and they, they may have bits and pieces of it but, but many times it depends on the severity you know uh, of the brain injury of what they can retrieve um, another type is called anterograde, which is really basically the inability to lay down new memory. And generally, from a pathophysiological standpoint, there's damage to the hippocampal structures of the brain where memories are formed. And, um, and, and that's where the research for that part of the, the brain damage is. If we, if we go much deeper, however, and we go into what the doctors um, referred to as a dissociative amnesia or other, other um, verbiage that you'll hear is psychogenic amnesia or functional amnesia, largely speaking to the same type of amnesia. It's, it's very rare. Um, it is probably underdetected. I can tell you, however, that in all the years of practicing, I, I have seen this on rare occasion. Um, the patients that I have dealt with, it's usually, generally always rooted in some type of level of trauma. Um, it's, if we talk epidemiology, um, it's, it's small as far as the prevalence in a 12-month period. We have 1.8% prevalence, 1% in men, and 26 in women as far as, as how, when you see this. And with a psychogenic type of amnesia, it is rooted in some type of trauma or stressful experience. It could be a multitude of reasons from everything to physical abuse, sexual abuse, rape, combat, um, tremendous internal conflict. And as I watched your film, um, Rick, I tried to kind of um, align where maybe some of this was coming from and just from what I've seen in practice. Sometimes a person can go into this type of 
amnesia or an amnestic syndrome related to um, guilt-ridden impulses or actions. Apparently, it, it can even be very deep, unresolved internal conflict, criminal behaviors, financial stressors, which, you know, as things came out, there was just more and more that, you know, you could see that possibly your dad ha had something going on. Um, and again, it's characterized by anything uh, lacking of any type of brain damage or any known neurobiological cause. Um, it is also commonly called repressed memory syndrome. And there's different types of psychogenic amnesia um, to include a global amnesia. Um, with a global amnesia, you will see movement from geographical place to geographical place, referred to as a fugue. And the person will have a very sudden loss of identity many times, accompanied by severe stress and or even a depression, um, periods of wandering and confusion and changes in mental status and alterations. It's very rare, and, and all of this is very rare. Um, and generally, the person will not remember the movement or even shifting from state to state. And another type of amnesia is called situation-specific amnesia, which is a type of amnesia that, that occurs after a very seriously stressful event. Um, many times when I have seen this, particularly, it's been with someone who has suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. And, and what you basically see that it's, again, more common among veterans, people who have been assaulted in some way, or have some deep-rooted conflict that has not been resolved in any way and repression over time and over time. And the onset of a dissociative amnesia is very sudden um, that it, where it comes to the surface. So there were some correlations too in, in, this, in this, the way this story portrayed. If we think back to some of the early frameworks of psychology and psychiatry and we, we take offshoots from Freudian psychology and neo-Freudian psychology, um, psychogenic amnesia is really an act of self-preservation, and it was very interesting because um, your, your brother Justin really kind of in a layman-type language kind of alluded to some of this that, um, you know, the person is just so overwhelmed and to the point that they have, their brain goes into this mode of having to make the decision, do I just kind of dissociate and remove myself from reality, or do I take on what could be an extremely overwhelming anxiety experience and or even contemplation of suicide? Um, and, and the brain kind of makes the decision on itself. So something that is very unpleasant, unwanted, or even psychologically dangerous, dangerous excuse me, as far as the memory formation, um, they repress them. And, and what happens is the brain naturally blocks it from the conscious state. So what happens is, in essence, there's a subconscious self-censorship, if you will, and the person themselves remains in the conscious world, but everything in their functioning becomes very um, subconscious and blocking it down. Now, in a normal brain and processing neurologically, what is called normal autobiographical memory, um, which we all do in, in our own identity and our own memories, it's blocked, but what happens is once the body goes out of a homeostatic or balanced state and becomes imbalanced, we have an ongoing thing of our st the stress hormones in our body, which are glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, and what they basically do, they really have an, a large impact on how we process memory. Particularly, we could do a neurobio lesson tonight, but we would kind of have to journey into the limbic regions of the brain. And what happens is it's like that's kind of where are we repeat memories, we put emotion to them, we put sensory information to them, and the more stress there is, this memory formation is blocked and recall is not available in, in the way memories are consolidated. So what happens in a lot of people with dissociative amnesia is that then over, it, generally it's maybe months, maybe you know, days, months, um, rarely is it to the point of decades, which I know your family has encountered, um, but so, with some people, and there was actually, uh, someone alluded to this too, maybe something, a sensory or a memory or a smell or something will bring it back. And that is sometimes when it happens through a sensory mechanism that there's some other identifier that'll kind of bring the person back to reality. And I know we're going to have a, another one of our panel members is going to talk about some of the therapies. But um, therapy, um, hypnosis, and stuff like that, absolutely, we have seen some people be to come back to a conscious state with this. Um, those who 
do have a psychogenic amnesia tend to lose their own biographical or episodic memories, sometimes to the extent of not even knowing their names or addresses or their children's names, um, particularly you know, that had led up to the early um, trigger of the, uh, the, the trauma or the stressor. And um, it, it's, it, what we're finding is that traumatic memories and events, and we've learned a lot of this from our veteran studies with PTSD, and what happens is when something is so traumatic to someone and they keep replaying this reel, if you will, over and over and over, if, so, if you don't have a disorder like this, you have a traumatic experience, but your brain, if, if you function normally and process it and move forward, it kind of stores it, if you will, if you think of like uh, filing cabinets in the brain and it puts it in a past memory. However, when someone has something that is dissociative or traumatic and, and they, they can't deal with the consequence, it's so traumatic and, and painful, they keep reliving it, thus a veteran with PTSD or someone who's had some type of other traumatic thing um, unresolved within them. So what happens is they keep seeing that memory as new and they keep reconsolidating it and that's how they keep it alive, if you will. Okay, so if, if the Kodak moment part of the brain, instead of putting it to rest, it's very vivid and graphic, graphic and keeps playing it. And they're finding that people that dissociate, they do this for a while and then they basically shut down and they stop remembering. And then uh, we're, a lot of the research is, and, and I'll, I'll use this in closing, is that um, it, we've had a lot of advancement in looking at the brain's ability to rewire and configure itself. It's called neuroplasticity. And there's a lot of studies being done right now with people that have had traumatic episodes and events. And they're showing promise with some different mechanisms to try to bring the memory back, if you will, and bring it into consciousness. And interestingly enough, one of the classes of medications are actually beta blockers, cardiac medications, that they're using now to do that. So um, you know, it just it's, it's fantastic that the brain definitely is has the power to restore itself, and um, and again, it's it's hard to really say, you know, because each person is going to process differently, and how someone can be prone to, you know, the resiliency of getting through a very traumatic event, where or another person literally will dissociate. But um, but like I said, it is rare, but it is it, inf it impacts everyone involved. As you said, the brain is a very unique organ of your body. Yes. And you know, we understand a lot about the heart, but yeah. we don't understand a whole lot about the brain. And uh, you know, Rick, as far as your family, you, it seems as though everyone in your family reacted to this situation a little differently and that they looked at things from a different lens. Um, and I, I wanna talk about to Luann about you know, your experience whenever, um, whenever an individual goes through a uh, psychiatric emotional event, uh, particularly following an accident, what's your experience been as far as uh, symptoms and signs that an individual will display um, in how it uh, connects with what we've been talking about with amnesia? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, according to the viewing in the records, Mr. Minich had no formal diagnosis prior to the accident. Reports revealed that he was rigid, he was a hard worker, a risk taker in reference to his employment, moving and having affairs. He seemed to want children, but he didn't want the responsibility that went along with them. He described himself as a Christian man, but then that was inconsistent. He was known to have outbursts. So if we look at memory, which Holly asked me to look at, uh, we have declarative memory and we have procedural memory. This all is a reference to Mr. Minich as, we, as you listen. Uh, declarative memory is conscience intentional memory. It's what patients want and try to remember. And we have two subtypes of declarative memory. We have episodic and we have semantic. Episodic memory involves remembering time, places, and experiences. Where were you on 9-11? What did you do on your wedding day? What was your last vacation like? That's episodic memory. Semantic memory is just knowledge and fact. Who is, the person, who is the current president? Where were you born? Then we go to a second type, procedural memory. This is how to ride a bike, how to print, how to write, how to drive a car, how to swim, how to play the piano. 
So Mr. Minich had significant episodic losses, memory losses, and procedural losses. Remember, he couldn't shave, he couldn't dress, he forgot how to work on computers, and per the records, he forgot how to have sexual relations. He also couldn't recognize things. He, call, he called a TV a box, he didn't recognize a computer, he forgot his ABCs. Sometimes it's concerning in what we do is patients may mistake shaving cream for toothpaste and brush their teeth that way. They may mistake matches with a toothpick and use matches. That's what we see in reality. He also displayed something called hypnotic age regression. And this is one when things, things from the past are occurring in the present. For example, he thought the president was President Kennedy. He called the computer a univac something typical in earlier times in the early computer era. So the first thing we do when we see something like this is rule out physical causes. The neurology service that evaluated Mr. Minich brought up the term diffuse agonal, axonal injury, diffuse axonal injury. What this is in today's term is traumatic brain injury or post-concussion syndrome, whatever. And this is when brain cells die because the brain rapidly shifts inside a closed skull and it causes microscopic damage. What's interesting is at the time he had this event, 1990, you can't see anything, any damage on the CAT scans, MRIs that were done then. So he, remember right after the accident, he had multiple neurological complaints. He had headaches, unsteadiness, visual abnormalities, personality changes, he was impulsive, and very childlike. He also experienced something called jamais vu. It's the opposite of deja vu. He, think that something, he thought that things were brand new and novel, when in reality he had been there or done those things multiple times in the past, such as delivering new, newspapers. It's interesting that his amnesia started exactly one week after the accident, and when his amnesia started, his headaches went away. That brought up a, an, an entertaining diagnosis of conversion disorder, and this is when a patient has several neurological complaints and it's incompatible with a medical condition. So as Dr. Spank note mentioned, Dissociative amnesia is rare, and it's sometimes still, even in today's world, a controversial diagnosis. Many clinicians will never see a true case in their entire careers. It's essentially a loss of a customary identity and assumption of a new one. So what happened? Prior to the accident, Mr. Minich was drawn to the external rewards of work. He had multiple jobs and multiple moves, and this gave him temporary comfort, but it became overwhelming. After the accident, he was able to see possible benefits of being dependent, having no stress and no responsibilities. Some say it's an extreme answer to coping, just as another extreme example would be, as Dr. Spank mentioned, suicide. That brings us to treatment. There's no evidence-based no evidence treatment for dissociative amnesia. It's rare and it's heterogeneous. That means no two cases are alike. We don't have experts because there's not enough cases to make anybody an expert. Medications are used only as supportive measures to treat underlying depression, associated anxiety, or any outbursts. There were five recommendations by psychiatry to help Mr. Minich, and these were Settlement of litigation in a way that recovery would not have adverse financial consequences. Two, family support and encouragement. Three, psychotherapy to help him work through the impact of trauma and its complicating effect on other life stressors. Four, controversial, but consider hypnosis that would penetrate the amnesia. The problem with this is it can create false memories. And the fifth was supportive medication. And our next speaker is going to talk about the goals of therapies and families. But we want to make sure that family, family edu teaching the family about the condition, the medications, what works, what doesn't work, helping them identify with the new Richard. The extended family already had vulnerabilities, and this situation made it more fragile. And just one final thing. If we look at the therapist that he was seeing, they both agreed not to bring up the past as it was too painful and just agreed to forget. And that brought up the term, new, the new Richard. 
Uh, finally, uh, there are new specialized imaging techniques that allow us to see different areas of the brain where if you're lying versus telling the truth. There's also new identified abnormal changes in brave brain activity that help us uh, move towards a diagnosis of dissociative amnesia. We now have specialized MRIs to detect that microscopic brain cell abnormalities. And I am going to uh, leave it to Christine to follow up with what we would do to help the family. You know, um, Luann, thank you very much. And, uh -huh. you know, as we've talked throughout this evening, your, you and your family members, your mother, your stepmother, your twin sisters, your stepbrother, your uncles, they all were part of this, and each one of them seemed to, to see it in differently and react differently. Uh, your stepbrother was very, very angry. Um, your sis twin sisters, you know, one was, you know, let them go, and one was very emotional. And uh, uh, Christine, I'd like you to talk about, you know, being a social worker in the hospital, and you see family dynamics. You see not only does, this, does, does the disease affect the patient, but they certainly affects the um, immediate family and the extended family. So if you can give us a sense of how you would bring in the, uh, or provide that support to the patient as well as the family. Sure. So when we witness or experience a traumatic event or an accident, we are all affected mentally and emotionally. Whether we're personally involved with the accident, if we have a friend or a family member that has been injured, or a rescue worker, or even a healthcare professional. Even if we learn the events through the media, we are all experiencing some sort of response emotionally or physically, a reaction. The emotional reaction that each person has is a normal part of the healing process, and each of us will react differently. Some reactions experienced may include, you can be numb, have the inability to express any of your feelings, sadness or crying, reoccurring memories or flashbacks, as well as dreams about the event that just occurred. <clears throat> the social withdrawal, you could be isolated. The mood changes, which can be nervousness, anxiety, irritability, the outbursts of anger, troubled concentrations, difficulty sleeping. Physical symptoms also can include fatigue, the lack of energy, aches and pains. Changing in eating habits, you'll also see that some can have consumed drugs and alcohol, and that's what we had seen a little bit in, that, in the movie that we had just witnessed, and the ability, inability to work or even function. After a crash, though, you may experience some of the, these different emotions as well, worrying too much about how you're going to manage things, feeling hopeless or helpless, worrying or even sometimes panicking when you have to leave your house, feeling traumatized or having bad memories again of the accident. So all of these feelings are a part of the normal grieving and recovering from these types of events. Also symptoms of situational or depression continued symptoms of alcohol use or drug use, the inability to function daily, or desire to no longer live are all heightened reactions to abnormal situations that require more intervention, which I'll discuss in a little bit. Symptoms like described are treatable medical illnesses. Most people respond to treatment and are able to bring their lives back to a balance. The healthiest thing you can do for yourself or a loved one is to be alert to the changes in your moods or your feelings. We know from a variety of studies that the chemistry in the brain changes in response to any traumatic event. We know that seeking assistance from healthcare providers after experiencing an event, trauma, or an accident is a reasonable response to any of these issues. The after effects of a type of experience is not something you can just pull out of or shake it off, snap out of it, things like that. The best response is generally three things, medical intervention, psychotherapy, and peer support. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about some interventions um, a patient or a family may need. Time. The first thing is time. Just allow yourself time to process what is going on, all the rushing of emotions so that you can recover. Talking to friends or family or even church members, those who you trust the most. Support groups, keeping your daily routines, and don't use drug or alcohol as a coping mechanism. Avoid major life decisions when you're under a lot of stress and you're not thinking clearly. Continue to take your medications as they're prescribed. Any alter in your medications could continue to escalate the symptoms. But most importantly, pay attention to your own symptoms and be ready to seek the help of other healthcare professionals. That includes psychologists or psychiatrists, social workers or counselors. Now how to help other types of support that are needed for families? Be on the lookout for signs and symptoms. Listen and allow them to express their feelings and their reactions. Respect the fact that everyone responds differently. Seek ways to support them that works for them, including find ways to talk with them. That sometimes is the hardest thing, is how do you respond to someone that's in a situation? You have to come to a ways to respond to them. Give support, and again, this goes back to understanding patience and encouragement. Reinsurance that they are safe. So very important for any age, but particularly important for children. You can reassure them as the adult that you are working hard to take care of them and to protect them. Spend time together as the family unit. And then assist them in getting the help of a counselor, again a social worker, psychiatrist, psychologist. And take all remarks regarding no, not wanting to live any longer serious. Lastly, I want to repeat that the best response generally is medical intervention, therapeutic assistance, peer support, be it of the psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, general practitioner. They can speak with you further in depth about the um, hypnotizing, as we had spoken about briefly, and some other interventions to help through the process. Before we open it up to the audience, Rick, can you give us a sense of, you know, this has been 27 years since yeah. the accident, and a lot of time has passed. Um, do you feel as though your family has gotten to a point of understanding and of resolution that the situation's not going to be like it was with the old Richard, that um, life continues to go on. Um, can you just give us a, and what, is there any difference with your father at this time? Is there any contact that you have with him? Okay, yeah. sure. Um, yeah, so this was in 1990 that this whole thing started and the film was finished in 2008. So I, was, I did my math wrong before. I was 42 when I started the film, not 32. No, I don't know, something like, <laughs> I was in my 40s. Uh -huh. I'm still in my 40s. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, the, the, when I first started approaching the family members about making this film, everyone was in favor of it, including my father at first and his, his wife, Tracy. They, I mentioned it in the film and, and they, I filmed with them some kind of sweet things of them singing songs together and playing the guitar and Tracy reciting some of her poetry and stuff like that. But then they made this sudden about face and didn't explain it to me really for two years. They just said it was for privacy issues. It, it turns out that it was my father's psychotherapist who had recommended that they not participate in it. But my father was afraid to tell me that, essentially. It, it came out when, when he and I went and saw her together uh, many years later. Um, but it, there was a, it was like the, the big question in the family that everyone, the big thing that everyone wanted to talk about, but we just didn't know how to. And a lot of the problem is because we were separated through this divorce so it was my sisters and I from the first marriage, and then Laura and Steve, our stepbrother and stepsister, those are the kids from Loretta, our stepmother from the second marriage, and then my little brothers, Matt and Justin, who were the product of that second marriage, who were three and eight at the time. So there was a lot of uh, sort of, we didn't 
when the accident happened, my sisters and I did not have a good relationship with our stepmother, Loretta. So when all this happened, she didn't reach out to us, basically. We found out through our grandmother, through my father's mother, who's interviewed in the film. There's some old footage of her in the film. So which this created a lot of resentment on the part of my sisters and me that our stepmother was, wasn't telling us what was going on, and we felt that we were better, maybe more capable of handling the situation than she was. She was not, um, she wasn't, uh, well, she, she wasn't working at that time. He was, my father was really very much the head of the household. That was the way their, their kind of the family dynamic was. So when he disappeared, I guess, she was completely overwhelmed and just didn't know what to do. And my stepsister, Laura, was living with him at the time with her baby. She had a baby, uh, was a single mom. And so there's a lot of, there were a lot of stress factors in the house, plus the two little kids. Um, so that basically everyone gre- is, was happy that I was making the film, except my father and it, at some point. And they kept, they were willing to talk to me and, and all that. And I felt kind of like I was the investigator for the family, and, and which put a lot of pressure on me. But at least everyone was cooperating, so it it gave me some. It gave me the sense that I was that it was a good thing that I was doing. Although part of me, this the son in me, suffered a lot by the fact that my father disapproved of the whole thing. So I felt like I was doing this behind his back, and that was really the most challenging thing for me because as a filmmaker I had a function I had a contract with the production company and we had there was money being spent um, so sometimes I was I would just go to the editing room I just couldn't function because I just couldn't look at this stuff fortunately I had a co-director Matt Sweetwood he's another American who lives in Germany Um, we've, we've made this is the second film that we made together so that really helped he was on all the film shoots with us and he was able to he didn't he got along beautifully with the whole family and he was able to focus on the filmmaking much more than I could at at many phases of the process so he really kept things going when I wasn't functioning very well Um, I saw my father a year ago it was the first time in about five years we he he now lives in a remote part of Wyoming he as, tip, as he always was, he likes to be in control. He made all the arrangements. He wanted to pick me up at, he flew me into Idaho Falls. I was in Alaska working on another film. He flew me into Idaho Falls. We stayed at a hotel there for a couple of nights. That, that's the nearest airport to where he lives. And then we went to his town in Wyoming and spent a night there. They didn't want me staying in their home, even though they have this enormous house. So they got a hotel room for me and it was all perfectly orchestrated the way he always orchestrated everything Uh, but we had a lot of good conversations and it was the final night when I finally asked him what I'd been wanting to ask him the whole time if he'd seen the film yet and he said yes he'd gotten a copy of it from his brother uh, my uncle and he'd seen it about a year earlier and I was kind of just yeah. waiting and <laughs> and he said um, it wasn't so bad <laughs> I think that's a compliment <laughs> and the way he said it I think I kind of had the feeling that he was trying to say um, well done Rick yes so in his kind of uh, way of, of saying things right. so um, that was uh, a great relief to me, that visit, because it kind of, this is the kind of story that I don't think you ever completely put to rest, but it felt to me very much like we'd kind of made peace with each other, and his health is not that great. If, he, if, it, if it worsens suddenly, um, I know, it, it, I, I, there's some consolation, the fact that I kind of think that we had the conversations <clears throat> that we needed to have about this issue. I want to open it up to the audience to ask any questions that you have of Rick or the other panelists as far as um, the the content of the film or the information that we had in the panel. Does anybody have a question? Gary. I had a sense of your father using escapism that life may have Uh, 
I think the women here can answer that better than I can. <laughs> that, that's the definition of dissociative. Most of the time, folks, will, when they have that fuge, they'll move 600 miles away and assume a complete identity. But the people that looked at uh, Mr. Minich thought that he liked dependency too much and he would not fit that model that would move away and assume a complete identity. You know how he liked control of things. That was his way of controlling the situation. Anybody else? That I agree with that fully. <coughs> the, the more we learned while investigating this film, especially the, the documents that my stepsister Laura found, where you see the scene where we're looking through that stuff, when we finally saw these medical records at last, a lot of, uh, it raised a lot of uh, questions, new questions, but it also gave us a few answers to what was really going on. Um, the language is difficult for us to understand, <laughs> um, but we, um, I kind of think he pulled the wool over our eyes in a lot of ways as a family, um, but we, we were, we didn't get what you were talking about, about the kinds of treatments, what the family needs and stuff, we basically didn't get any of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that was partly because of the communication problems within the family, this divided family, partly because my sisters and I were, I was living in Europe, my sisters were in their mid-20s, they were starting their careers and stuff. We, um, he was far away, my sisters were in Los Angeles, he was up in Northern California, it became difficult just to, on, on many types of levels. And there was, yeah, it, it, there's this f sense of, of not knowing <clears throat> who to turn to. Sure. And when it becomes evident there's a that it's mental health issue, it becomes more difficult just because of the social taboos involved. Mm -hmm. so. Another question for Rick. I just want Rick, he moved so much what was that last move to Wyoming for? Like he had so many moves. Yeah, yeah. That's it. And we had that our wood paneled station wagon that we used to <laughs> move around. And, um, he left my sisters. It was very sudden when they left California, and my sisters and I had a strong feeling that they just he, that was that he didn't like being in a place where people knew the old Richard. Uh -huh. And when they moved to Arizona uh, to Oregon, where they lived when we shot the film, uh, they were able to leave all that behind. But his past did creep back in when, when indirectly, when, when I came to town or when my uncle yeah, moved up there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think at some point they really wanted to get away from all that, so they moved to Wyoming three years ago. How I old believe. is he now? He was born in 1944, so was that 73? Okay. Yeah. He had a... Um, he, he, the, his whole health issues were complicated by the fact that he had a massive heart attack and had a quadruple bypass operation and I was not around. He didn't want any of us around at that time, but one of my sisters, who was the one who was on the best terms with him at that time, did visit him in the hospital. And there were a lot of complications with uh, problems with his brain stem, some things back here that during the whole thing, he was constantly uh, screaming for ice packs and, and my sis, the nurses just thought he was, he thought he was crazy. You know, what's going on with this guy? And um, I don't know, it's, I can't explain it. At some point I, I stopped trying to understand it and, and decided for myself that if he had <clears throat> such a deep need for something like this to happen, then um, it's, it's, it's just totally out of our control. It has not, it's not necessarily a reflection that we were um, a bad family or stressed him out or something. It was really something that, that uh, was, was deep down inside him. And I, th I think he had a lot of childhood trauma too. He, there's a whole part of the film that we cut together that we ended up taking out that was more about his childhood. And that they moved around a lot. His father was a minister, a church minister, but not very successful. So they got sent from parish to parish, moved around a lot. They were extremely poor. And he was really traumatized by that and had a very um, 
he he dropped out of college he and my mom after their first year because the, my mom got pregnant with my sisters and then it, it this all happened at the point when my sisters and I were just getting our college educations and he was he was um kind of resentful it was a it was a thing that was weird between my our mother and, and father that our mother was <clears throat> very proud of us mm -hmm. that we were moving on and he was kind of like yeah. we were getting what he never got that's for you you can take me out for a drink afterwards <laughs> They they are quite accepting of it. It was um, it was a, a hard to process it all. We never all got together and watched it all at once. We had a screening in Los Angeles where that side of the family was there. My sisters and another brother of mine who's from my mother, not the other side of the family. It's complicated. There were there there were ten of us now. There's nine of us left um, from all the different marriages. My father had five kids. So then, then I was up in, in Davis, in Northern California for a screening with that side of the family, with my stepmother and my stepsister and my brothers, my half-brothers on that side. Justin, who you see at the, at the end of the film, we take that trip together. They, they were really relieved to watch it, actually. And my um, stepmother felt really good about it, that she... Um, it gave her some kind of answers. Mm -hmm. She felt very alone and overwhelmed, and <clears throat> it, you know, she lost her husband. She her marriage fell apart. Um, she's never really recovered. She's never remarried. She doesn't even date. She just um, she still lives in Northern, Cal Northern California. She lived with her daughter for a while. Um, that yeah, she she really um, it really hit her heart. Carrie, did you have another question? The, the most common trigger for dissociative amnesia is during war times or a natural disaster. Those are the two times that, that it most frequently occurs. And even in those cases, it's still rare. Any add? Any? Yes. But it also could be that some unresolved issue, like Rick mentioned in childhood, the trauma that his father had, and just even the stress, and even alluding to what you just said, that maybe just feeling like that he never got his turn, and mm -hmm. you know, just that, that, that identity of, of the self, and not really feeling whole in, in who he was. So a lot of times people will repress things over and over, and then it just gets to the point where there's almost just like the break from reality, and it, it is a protective mechanism. So. It, you may never really know truly how much is was, was buried, you know. But it's generally, yeah, yeah PTSD with with war or a, a disaster is the most common type of event. When I was reading over everything, he liked change. He he changed jobs. He changed locations. He changed wives. Maybe why not change identity? I don't, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, just part of his mindset. There is something happy I would like to report in all this. My um, my brother Justin is doing very well. Oh, he um, he kicked his heroin addict heroin addiction after ten years. Through uh, first he's on methadone and then he he got weeded down on that and he w did finally get over it a couple years ago. Um, he still smokes pot, but I think that's pretty harmless. Um, and he. He was a fabulous chef. He actually went to culinary school in San Francisco, which he partially financed by selling drugs. Also, while we were making the film, it was 
I don't even want to talk about some of the situations we got in that we <laughs> left out of the yeah, film. But he is now running his own restaurant in San Francisco. It's, um, and he was, he's very happy about the film. I was watching him cook. Yeah. He was doing yeah. pretty good. <laughs> yeah, he was. We have another question up here. Yeah, so with dissociative amnesia, you said sometimes there will be a stimulus that will recall those memories. So does that become a personal choice not to accept those memories, or is that still the brain's protective mechanism to avoid those memories? I'm sorry, I didn't. If it's a protective mechanism, protective mechanism to yes. avoid the memories as opposed to... Exactly, as opposed to dealing with them and keeping them kind of at bay because to feel them is going to be way too painful um, and could just allude, allude to like opening the whole Pandora's box of memories and then just really kind of like an, almost an anxiety response where it's overwhelming. And, and like I said, people who have been traumatized, it's very common that they do... Thought, think about suicide or even possibly carry it out and then complete it. But yeah, that is a, it's a protective mechanism. They do. Oops. Well, then I'll get <laughs> Well, first of all, again, thank you to all of you. I mean, as the Associate Dean for the School of Nursing and Health Sciences, I'm busting with pride for <laughs> three of my esteemed faculty members here. And, um, and many thanks to Helena for this collaborative effort. Um, okay, so I guess what I would like to ask is more along the lines of dissociative, dissociative identity disorder. So, so moving Very away different. from the um, amnesia mm -hmm. component. And I think for those of us who might know of that as multiple personality disorder, mm -hmm. what I found interesting were that there was the component in the video where, where your father took on the childlike he liked coloring and, and playing with you know, the six-year-old sibling or at that particular time. So I guess what I wanted to ask you first, was there a, a time where you or your family thought there was more than one new Richard? Were you seeing signs that there, had, there possibly were multiple personalities dissociating? And I think I would pose that same question maybe to Janine and Luann, having watched it several times now, did you find maybe some clinical presentation that made you think he dissociated more than just into the new Richard? Do you, do you want to start? Do you want to? Uh, I'm going to go back to the uh, DAI dissociative axonal injury. That the childlike behavior is very common with that, so that may have triggered it. What my question uh, to Rick would be is, did he continue that childlike behavior all through the time, even to Wyoming? Because in the pictures, as you could see, there was that very immature-like figure throughout the whole tape. So, yeah. I would say from, from what I can remember is that it was more like the first five or six years that he was so childlike. He actually, um, one incident I do remember is he liked to play at the playground with his sons, with my little brothers. And he, at one point, jumped off the jungle gym and broke his ankle. And the doctor said to him, um, Richard, um, don't write any checks that your body can't cash. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of stuck with me because he really felt childlike and didn't realize that he's was a middle he was a middle aged man and um, couldn't do all the things that his little sons could do. <laughs> um, at the same time, there were moments. This is what really threw all of us off in the family. There were moments. I wouldn't say that that multiple personalities seemed to be showing through. It was more like the old Richard seemed to be showing through. It's like if he wanted, if a situation arose that that required some kind of adult responsibility, he would quickly play the child card and kind of get out of it. And he, it's, it's kind of like he would be an adult when he wanted to, but he'd, yeah, he'd kind of disappear. I think my step, Loretta, stepmother Loretta sells it pretty well in this one um, interview when she's sitting in the kitchen. She says it was, she felt like, um, he was there, and it's like the old Richard, and then it's like the, the shades went down, and he'd go back to being yeah. being uh, the, the new Richard. And that was a sensation that all of us felt. 
um, and we and it, it, that's what made us feel like something's not right here. He's faking it or something. And I mean, that's why I get asked all the all the time. You know, do you think it's real? Do you think he's faking it or something? And I think that's maybe not the right question to ask. It's at some point I just quit thinking of it in terms of is this real or not because I. Um, it seems, from what I understand and listening to your experiences too, there's I think there's quite a big, a, a pretty big gray zone that I have, have have actually learned to embrace because I think it's what makes us human beings so fantastic is that we are um, pretty difficult to figure out and we can't be reduced to uh, algorithms or something like that. I just want to add, he mentioned in the medical, when he was interviewed from the multiple medical people, he thought he was between 8 and 12 years of age. So that was interesting. Like, if I have to ask one question during my hour-long interview about childhood, I'll always say, tell me what life was like when you were about 12, because that's where we kind of go when we need a, a concise history of everything and what made you feel safe and who made the rules. Because did you get that thing? Yeah. Like something's happened in there. He did stay with his extended family without his mom and dad for about a two-month period, and he did not like that. I wondered, like, did anything go on there? Or, like, yeah. I just want to add a couple yeah. of things just to maybe yeah. um, just food for thought. Yeah. As far as your question about dissociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personalities, generally for diagnostic, which it's so, you know, the, the, it was just so It's skewed. not like split. It's not likely. <laughs> it's very split. There was even consideration to not include it in the DSM-5, which right. <laughs> in, in 2013 when they redid it after 14 years, but then it was, it was is included. Um, but it just, categorically, there has to be at least two to eight personalities that emerge right. And they can be different sexes, different ages, um, different voice intonation, you know, when they come out. And like I said, it's extremely rare. I can tell you that in 25 years, I've probably only seen it for real one time and a second time, questionable. But basically, the person that has this will even know what the dissociation, the person that I treated yeah. actually could name their personalities. They were all given names and it was a female and she actually, but she would have male and female personalities of different ages and different, even one was a baby and she would speak in a baby voice. But it was really, really clear cut when the dissociation was occurring and almost a fixed glaze would come over the person's face, the pupils, and you could just almost trance like, and she would literally go into a completely different dialect. Even one of them was even a foreign language. So it was really, really like, whoa, like what is going on? Um, more so than just kind of staying maybe in a childlike state. Now I'm not saying because the brain, as we said, is a very <laughs> impressive thing. The other thing when, um, Yes, when um, we talked about how he would kind of go back and forth with their stepmom to, from the old Richard to the new Richard, there really is another, yet another form of amnesia. Again, these are all rare, but it's called um, like a transient global type of amnesia. And the latest research and study right now that's being done is looking at the blood vessels because it does kind of come and go. And they, you will see kind of going back to more of a, a normal function or normal personality again, and then it fluxes again very rapidly. So, and like even what in the reports about when he was describing yeah. the pain, so you, it makes you really yeah. wonder if something from a vascular yeah. and vessel type standpoint that for so whatever reason knows. didn't, it's hard to really say, yeah. this is so Could complex. Yeah. But I just really wonder from hearing if that, if that in any way has anything to do with this. That's really interesting to me because some things did show up. He did suffer from high blood pressure his entire adult life and high cholesterol levels. And I remember when I was a kid that you know he, he would eat these fake eggs, like yeah. egg beaters. Yeah. They're called, I don't know yeah. if they're still around, or things like that. And I had a screening in Germany several years ago that was a meeting of yeah. neuropsychologists. And there was an environmental doctor there. I don't know, what would you call someone? Like, what are they called in English? I don't know. Um, he asked me a lot of questions about my father's, like where my father lived concretely. And I said, you know, he, he worked as a, on farms in Kansas when he was growing up and stuff. And he says, you know, he might have been exposed to a lot of pesticides or there's all these kinds of things. And this doctor explained to me that, it, that there's a build, like a toxic buildup in your body. And sometimes in, in one of these medical reports, I believe, 
the one doctor wrote about it, like the glass, it's like your glass is filling up with all these stressors and factors. And at some point it takes a little incident, like you say, often a um, wartime situation or an environmental disaster or something like that, that, that makes it spill over. And in this case, I think it was this car accident and the, the um, whiplash yeah. from the suffered. Now we have one more question. Personally, I think we would pay more attention to the physical symptoms earlier. We have newer scans with imaging. We would take that direction. There, there's some books out. You may have seen like the man who mistook his wife for a hat yes. with very rare neurological things. There, there's a second book out that describes almost a similar situation where nobody believed the patient and then they did end up finding that there was something in the visual cortex. So. So I wonder that too. Is there different imaging now? We have even, yeah, yeah, I agree. yeah. yeah. Just the PET scans and, and positron emission see. and fluoroscopy. We're able to actually see cellular metabolism and reuptake of, you know, neurochemicals and axonal damage and and how mm -hmm. signals and circuitry transmit. So you really do wonder, because satisfa yeah. too head injury. A lot of changes yeah. occur. It's the brain stays in an inflammatory state. You know, there's yeah. a flux of calcium, so you know anything after a head injury. So yeah. it's hard to say if this was now we were looking at it. If it would be yeah. interesting to see, you know, if, if the findings yeah. would be the same. The brain is fascinating. I have patients, elderly patients, who are uh, very much advanced with Alzheimer's disease, who confabulate. They tell me stories about their husband. I have to go home and cook for him. And in, in reality, they've been dead for seven years. But they've actually passed lie detector tests because they think they're telling the truth. Mm -hmm. You know. So I mean, it's fascinating with imaging and and what and we're the status learning. of mental illness today too. Yes. You know, it's not like a taboo. It was maybe 27 yeah. years ago yeah. that people are more open that these things actually do occur and that people aren't making it up and they're yeah. you know it's it's a disease it's not a um a an act yes but i want to thank this panel of thank you. for a great discussion and rick thank you very much for sharing your film with us and um, it uh, you know taking the film even further and discussing some of the things from a clinical perspective i think has made made it really um stand out for me, and I appreciate that. Well, I would like to say thank you to everyone. This is the, has, the film came out in 2008. I've I spent two years traveling all over the world with it, but I've never had this in-depth of a yeah. medical <laughs> discussion about it, which was really enlightening to me, and it, it brings back a lot of, um, uh, a lot of yeah. clin conflicting feelings yes. watching the film again and, and yeah. talking about it again, but my one of my hopes with the film is uh, in making it was that people would see it and that um, it could help uh, um, start some more discussions about family trauma issues and mental health issues because it's it's there's a I think there are a lot of um, difficult situations in families that can if they're caught early uh, identified early enough situations like this can possibly be avoided or at least they could be treated more quickly and more effectively and, and not become so, you know, so explosive. 
So I'm, I'm glad that there is more discussion now about mental health issues in general. And um, it would be interesting to see what kind of scans would show up on my father's brain these yeah, days. Yeah. But quite frankly, um, he, he did have the, the fortune of finding Tracy, this woman who's only a few years older than I am and who um, inherited a lot of money so that he has, I think he, in the end, he got what he wanted. He has someone to take care of him and he still has most of us in his life uh, somehow completely on his terms. Uh, but there is some kind of an, an emotional relationship which has developed yeah. between us. He still s says to me that I'm someone he's known for 27 years. He doesn't, he still says that there's nothing from, be from before that period. I don't know if that's true or not, but I've stopped asking myself that question. I'm just <coughs> learning, <coughs> learning to appreciate the moments we have now. Thank you all for attending.